Hello, folks. Hello. Sorry, we're experiencing some technical difficulty. I do believe we are live now. I do believe we are live now. We have Misty. We have everybody set up, ready to rock and roll. Uh, if anybody is seeing us on Facebook, just uh, shout out, uh, give us a comment uh, so we know it is it is working. Um, please make sure. Is it working? Uh, it is working. So, folks, we are really excited to, to be back with Agrilatcha tonight. We have the absolute magnificent. Miss Misty Skaggs, there she is. Really excited to uh, to um, uh, to have her uh, this afternoon and and uh, to talk about planting by the signs and tell us some really cool stories about uh, uh, about farming in Eastern Kentucky. So uh, a little bit about Misty. She was born in the backwoods of Eastern Kentucky and still live and work from a holler in Elliott County, where she tends to poetry her garden and her mamma. She's an artist and activist, as well as an author and editor, and my Appalachian roots are tightly entangled with all of her work. She's identified herself as a feminist as, a, as long as the term has been part of her vocabulary, and she truly believes in the power of art and literature to facilitate real social change. My type of person. I am current, or She is currently a part of administration collaborative team behind the Appalachian Feminist Coalition, and they're pushing 10,000 followers on Facebook and Instagram. That is a successful feat these days. She's been leading creative writing workshops and publishing short stories, poetry, and literary journals throughout the region for over a decade. She's got a few self-published uh, underground Zine-style works that have been well-received in academic circles, including two collaborative collections with her mother, an artist, Benita Skaggs Parsons, entitled Prescription Pains and Mommy, Mama and Them. Both of the projects were presented at the Appalachian Studies Association. She's published two books in the past two years. The first, Biscuits and Blisters, came out in 2018 after uh, she won a chat book contest conducted by Workhorse in Lexington, Kentucky. And then uh, on September 24th, 2019, she published Planted by the Signs, her first full-length collection of poems, and that's what she's going to be talking about tonight, folks. Let's give her a warm we welcome, Misty Skaggs. Oh my goodness. Hello, Jason. And thank you so much for inviting me. I am so excited to be here. Um, I think uh, as long as I've been in the working and living in the hillbilly word nerd circle, I have wanted to get in on a project with Hyman Settlement School. So I am super excited that Hyman has decided to have me. And uh, I'm super excited to be here and talk with y'all tonight. I hope I'm able to see everybody's comments. There we go. I was switching over to the public feed there because I want to be able to interact with y'all as well. And maybe we'll hear some of your planted by the sign stories too. Um, I think I just want to start with a little bit of an introduction, a little about me. Uh, Jason covered a lot of that. My mama's here watching tonight, y'all. Bonina Parsons. Hi, mommy. We're going to talk a little bit about her and about how she contributed to my book and to my being and everything I am. Uh, hi, Rebecca. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm so excited again to be here with y'all. But I want to tell you a little bit about me. Again, I was born and raised in Elliott County. I was born and raised uh, on a tobacco farm uh, most of my life. We were about the cash crop until we got bought out like most small farmers do uh, when I was around 14 or 15 years old. And life, you know, it totally changes after that once you lose the farm. Because up until that point, you know, I had been living in a world where life revolves around the crops. You know, uh, you get your new school shoes and your new school clothes when you take that tobacco into market. And uh, you are a part of something when you're a part of that crop and the harvest. And I don't want to get too far off track. But I have learned everything I know from my family and growing up on a farm and growing up around farmers, uh, especially my mommy's people. Uh, my great grandmother, Lobel Blinkenbeckler, taught me everything I know about planting by the signs, which sadly is not as much as it dang well should be. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too. But I wanted to read you guys the preface from my book, Planted by the Signs. And this is out from Ohio University Press. 
This is actually a photograph that I took on the cover. And please excuse this copy. It's my reading copy. It travels with me. It's it's meant a cup of coffee or two. It's a beat up a little bit. Uh, but this is my book, Planted by the Signs. It's available from Ohio University Press. It's also available from a lot of your small town bookstores. Please hit those up and patronize them right now. And um, I was excited that they decided to use some of my photographs too. So that's my chubby little hand in a, in a sink full of dishwater. And here on the back, you can see that's my mamaw's hands, my beautiful mamaw, Joyce Skaggs, uh, breaking beans there on the back of the book. But I wanted to kind of let you guys get to know me and my experience with planting by the signs and why that phenomenon and Appalachian tradition is associated with this book by reading y'all the preface from this, from this book. <clears throat> A great mamaw's house, there was always a pone of cornbread on the kitchen table, and maybe if you were lucky, some buttermilk biscuits left over from breakfast. At Great Mamma's house, there was always something to eat fresh from the garden, and there was always something to read, too. It was heaven on earth for a fat little hillbilly word nerd. There were back issues of National Geographic stacked up in the corner of the living room, a basket of trashy romance novels with seething, sultry, shirtless men overflowed next to Great Mamaw's recliner. There was a Kennedy biography and a beat-up flea market copy of Profiles and Courage displayed on the side table right next to her commemorative presidential plate. The family Bible squatted solemn and thick and reverent on her nightstand with its gossamer thin pages at rest and not to be disturbed by the grubby, clumsy hands of youngins. Out in the rusty little camper where she stored all the scrap material from her quilts, she also stashed the racy True Detective magazines that I was never supposed to find. My favorite book, though? My favorite book was her favorite book, the one she made good use of and referred to most often. The book that Great Mamma kept tucked away in her apron pocket or laid out within reach, easy to get to on the crooked little coffee table, the old farmer's almanac. My Great Mamma lived her life by the signs. She knew when the moon waxed and waned above her little holler, and she knew what its moods meant for the soil her roots were planted in. This collection is inspired by and written for my Great Mamma. Lovell Blankenbeckler. It was my honest to goodness honor to care for her at the end of her life, and many of the following poems were written during that time. My great mamma taught me her ways. Those were ways forgotten and buried in the pages of the almanac. I'm emotional right now, y'all, and I'm sorry. She taught me to look up at the sky and to feel the stars move through my body and right on into the ground. She taught me to know when to plant and harvest, and she taught me to know when to bloom. She passed just a little while before my first book came out, and she was such an avid reader. I would have loved for her to have been here and uh, seen this book and, and shared this experience with all of us, but that kind of gives you an idea <clears throat> of what I'm about and where this book came from and where my roots are planted. Uh, very much right here in eastern Kentucky. Uh, it's where I was raised and it's probably where I'm gonna die. I'm um, one of those diehard hillbillies. And planting by the signs is a tra tradition that I think a lot of us are aware of, but sadly that we have lost as a people. Um, when Jason approached me to do this to do this event, I thought, okay, and I told him straight up, I said, Jason, I would love to do anything that the Hindman Settlement School will let me do. But in all honesty, I am not necessarily an expert at planting by the signs. Give me a couple weeks to try and find a farmer who still uses that method primarily. So I went to town, y'all. I, I hit up every farmer I know. All the old men out on the ridge and, you know, all my agro hipster friends who are, you know, learning farming and practicing experimental methods. And I hit up all my Grow Appalachia peeps and my 
kids I know who graduated from a good ag program peeps. <laughs> and I went on the search for people who are still planning by the signs. And what I found is that a lot of this tradition is gone. Uh, um, it's dying. It, even in those who are aware of it, like me, people like me, and even those who are raised by it, we are letting it slip away from us. And uh, I told Jason, I was, I was the muscle, you know, mamma was the brains and I was the muscle. And that's the truth, you know, uh, she was the one who went out and picked up that calendar every year. And she was the one who made the schedule of when we would plant and when we would prune and when we would harvest. And we all turned to her, not just our family, you know, my cousins from out the road from way on out the ridge would call and say, Aunt Lovell, is today a good day for beans going in the ground? And all she had to do was flip that calendar and have a look. Um, but that made me think of a poem that I wrote, this idea that we are sadly letting this tradition slip away from us. And um, the idea that even the bearers of the labor of planting by the signs don't quite understand it. So I did have one, one poem from my book, uh, Biscuits and Blisters. It's from Workhorse Press out of Lexington, Kentucky. And as you can tell, that's a lard can on the front. I, I was raised on some lard. But um, the conversations that I was having with a lot of my peers and neighbors made me think of this poem and the idea that even though we are doing the work, we don't fully understand why we are letting that part of our agricultural tradition, one of our agricultural traditions, be swept away. And this poem is called The Heart is a Muscle. I live in the secret holler holy land. I serve as handmaiden to the hillbilly high priestess. I plant and harvest on her word by the zodiac. I wear her hand-me-downs. I am her wrinkled limbs freed from arthritis and age. I build her muscles, hoeing rows of green beans and pulling weeds away from the beef hearts. The hospice nurse is a brunette. I find her soothing. She's good at her job. Maria, the bespectacled brunette, she cooed to me like a morning dove about Faulkner. Her fingers lingered on my backwoods bicep. This woman who waits out death for a living, she says, you're doing everything right. I blush and I nod. And I refuse to believe her. And I think that poem has death at the end. Um, I took care of my great-grandmother at home until she passed away in our home. That's where she wanted to be. And I made sure that she had what she needed, uh, as well as my mama. And, you know, a lot of other family members chipped in. But I was there with her uh, all the way up to the end. And this poem just made me think about the zodiac and you know the way that we take direction from the elders and at the same time we take them for granted uh so some i just wanted to read some of the reactions that i got um there were a couple that i wrote down specifically uh, and i said like most like like myself most of the folks that i spoke to uh were the muscle not the brains behind the planting all the sign planting and the planning came from an older family member and one of my favorite reactions was this and i quote the only thing i know about planting by the signs is i must not be doing it right my papa always said your tomatoes won't make it if you plant in the wrong sign and i ain't had so much as a bloom but the plants are waist high and i had that experience myself this year uh i planted in the wrong a uh, sign in my tomatoes also grew to be about yay high and didn't get a bloom on them all year. It was such a waste and it made me so angry. And it's my own damn fault for not going and getting one of those almanac calm calendars. Here was another great one that I thought was a funny little quote that just a piece of the tradition of planting by the signs that has stuck with someone. Uh, she said, I just remember my granny would buy a potato, just a whole tater, and she'd plant it in the ground on St. Patrick's Day because for some reason it would bring a good harvest. 
And I'm not even sure of that one. I couldn't find anything about that one being associated with the signs, or maybe that's just an old uh, tradition uh, to bring on some good luck in the Appalachian region. But the Zodiac Man is where I wanted to go next. When we say planting by the signs, what we mean is we are planting by the phases of the moon, really. We are planting by the waxing and waning of the moon. And uh, we assign that in the almanac. The Farmer's Almanac assigns that to the Zodiac Man. What my memo always says, she never said you plant when the moon is in Taurus or you plant when the moon is in Aries. She would say, you plant when the signs are in the head. And the zodiac man is where that terminology comes from. Uh, the man of the signs is in the cover of every farmer's almanac if you ever picked one up. And that was an inspiration for my book as well. So I was, I'm really lucky in that I was born into a family full of really impressive hillbilly artists and women. And my own mother did the frontispiece for my book. Let me see if I can get it up here where you guys can see it. This is me as the Zodiac Man. You have all the signs assigned to their right body parts. I just love that. That frontispiece was done by my mother, who's an artist, Bonita Skaggs Parsons. And, um... What I wanted to talk to you guys about was when I put this book together, the publishers asked me, how would you like to organize it? It's a great collection, but it needs some structure. You need to find a way to put this together so that it tells a story. And one of my first thoughts was, okay, let's tell the story of a farm. Let's tell stories of planting and harvesting and good years and bad years and crops that make it and crops that don't and people that make it and people that don't and I thought that was a great metaphor for my grandmother's life for my mamaw's life and for my great mamaw's life and uh, so I started to work on separating this book into sections the first section of the book is called when the signs are in the head like i said and aries is a sign that is in the head um so the problem with with that is aries is a fire sign fire signs by the tradition are barren you should never plant in a fire sign or an air sign so you don't want to do your planting in when the signs are in the head um when the signs are in the head this is a great time to prepare the ground so the first section of my book is all about preparation and getting things ready and starting to tend crops. Um, this is not, a, you can tend to your crops during this time, but don't plant. Just do not put anything in the ground when the signs are in any kind of fire or air sign. Um, but to me, it meant a lot of preparation. It meant, it meant that time of year. So the first the first part of this book is a little bit about winter and the planting season coming and the beginning of starting to put things in the ground and preparing the ground for that. Uh, and I wanted to read you a few poems from the section of that book. And I hope this is, is this useful to y'all? And please feel free to chime in. And uh, I'm loving having comments over here that I can look and see the hi Josh Mullins and I see Sean Turner, a poet friend of mine. Emily is a great name to see on the list there. Um, thank you for being here, Mandy and Linda and Anita. Oh my goodness, what a good crowd. So yeah, if you guys have any comments, please just chime in. I'm that kind of person. I will stop and talk to you right now. And I hope Hyman Settlement School is okay with that because that's the hillbilly way of doing it, right? But I want to read you a poem um, that I think says a lot about, uh, again, about where I was in my life when this book was written and how I needed to uh, assess things and prepare the ground and prepare myself for difficult things that were coming ahead of me. And this poem is called Creosote Sunrise. The sunrise on Stark Ridge is spectacular today. All the right spots on the spectrum are represented crimson edged in magenta, deep orange, and the simmering yellow of a new splash day over cloud splattered sky. I want to get lost in it, 
but all I can think about is the stovepipe and the crackle of creosote, that phantom black crackle rubbing my nerves the wrong way and tinkling against my eardrums, that primordial sounding shit, the revenge of a stick of wood gone in too green and the spirits of sap scorched out of pine kindling who can look at the sky and follow the smoke to the stratosphere when there's so much dirty work to do right down here on the ground. Lordy y'all, you see the popo going by? Oh my goodness. I just moved to a new neighborhood. If you can call it a neighborhood way out here in the sticks. But uh, I hear it's a rough part of town. I don't know, I ain't had no trouble with my neighbors. They're awfully friendly, but uh, pardon that little interruption. I wanted to do a couple more from this section of the book and just kind of get you guys into my mindset and let you know what I was thinking and feeling as we started to go into um, this season of my life when the signs were in the head, when I, when I was in my head and I was preparing myself and getting myself together to move on and bloom and be a better person than I am now. So uh, this is a poem that I wrote and it's in the first section of the book when the signs are in the head. Uh, it's called Small Talk. Now I will forgive me if the language is a little salty. I tend to tell it like it is and I tend to do that in plain spoken language because poetry is for everybody y'all. It is not some esoteric unattainable thing. Poetry is yours and mine and it's your granny's too. So uh, this one's called Small Talk. Nobody wants to hear about my new hauler life. Even though I listen courteously to classes swill spilled over organic dinners with vegan options. My small talk is not spicy like an authentic curry recipe. It's mostly salt and pepper. My anecdotes don't unfold in smoky bars or seedy truck stops or one room flops for misguided horny hillbilly youth. At least not anymore. Nobody wants to hear about bowel movements. Black and hard, lumps of sick coal staining the bowl. Nobody wants to hear about caring for a dying woman who will never be ready to die. Or about how her arm hurts and aches until she screams. About how I stay up all night and heat towels to wrap her tired limbs about her heart failing congestively. Everybody wants to hear about how we sit around and talk shit on Herbert Hoover, about how she refers to Johnny and June like family. Everybody wants to hear about how she loves to read the raunchy romances, the ones with shirtless pirates or lusty-eyed cowboys on the cover. But nobody wants to hear about how sometimes I sit straight up as I'm drifting off. And it's my heart. It stops. And I could swear I can hear her soul leaving her body through the baby monitor. I, I don't mean to bring y'all down tonight. I'm making myself emotional. I was making myself emotional as I prepared for this because my grandmother was such a huge part of my life. And... And she took her planting by the signs very seriously. I keep mentioning the calendar. So how many of y'all out there had a granny who had the almanac calendar? It's usually, we always had to go to Olive Hill and go to the bank or the hardware store. Those were the two places that would give them away for free because Memo wasn't really too fond of buying the almanac, but sometimes she would just get the calendar and use that for her quick reference. But I loved staring at that almanac calendar. It had all the phases of the moon, and it would tell you what days were good for getting a haircut, uh, what days were good 
for, you know, that's what I loved. They, they could tell you how to help with your like personal everyday things. Like don't try and go try to get a loan on this day. It's a bad day for money. Or if you get a haircut on this day, it's not going to grow back fast enough. You know, it's not going to grow very fast. I love that the farmer's almanac touched every part of, of their lives and our lives. Um, I want to skip right ahead and pick the mood up a little bit after that sad little poem there. Um, everybody had it. Everybody had it. I don't know many grandparents who didn't. I don't know if everyone used it, but at least the reference was there. You know, my, my memo was pretty serious about using it. Uh, she wouldn't plan anything at all without consulting it first. But uh, everybody has a copy, it seems like. And, you know, that's something I learned that not every, that's not the same everywhere. Um, the only time I've ever lived away from Kentucky, I lived in the middle of the Midwest, where they have some of the most beautiful, rich soil and what I deemed to be lazy farmers. <laughs> I hate to talk shit like that, y'all. But when you grow up on a tobacco farm, that is some labor intensive work. You know, there are a lot of steps to planting and harvesting tobacco. And I would watch these boys out there calling themselves farmers and they climb up in their air conditioned combines and they ride for a cornfield that went for about 20 miles. And I don't know, to me, it was a little bit of a cop out, but I never once saw an almanac out there. Speaking of um, tobacco, I would like to read a little bit of a poem. Let me see if that's in this section. There's one more in this section I want to read. No, that 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 we're going to save on. We're going to do one more here. And this one is from the first section when the plant when the when the signs are in the head. This is not a planting poem. It's a tending my garden poem. Uh but this one's called War Amid the Cabbage. And let me show off my let me show off my pretty little cabbage head. You can't quite see it too great. I don't know I'm navigating this camera. That's that's a photograph of mine, and that's from my garden, y'all. This one is a little more lighthearted, and I hope it will make you smile when you envision it. Uh, it's called War Amid the Cabbage. The garden is plowed, and planting season is in the air between snowflakes. I keep thinking about the time me and that cutworm went to war. It was a backyard brawl. One-on-one -on -one in a raised bed arena built from concrete blocks and designed to coddle my cabbage. Somewhere buried deep under all that dirt I packed in, one wheelbarrow load at a time, it lurked, mocking me, waiting quietly in the underground dark to sabotage my future sauerkraut. You should have seen me, y'all down on my hands and knees with a sieve and a spoon, sifting slowly through the soil, working up a sweat and cussing up a storm and determined to slay my solitary, slimy enemy. That is 100% a true story. I spent two days after that cutworm. I found the little bastard though, I'll tell you that. One thing I am, it's dedicated. <laughs> I'm so glad. I can't tell like how many people are watching, but I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who is. Thank you to all my beautiful friends who've tuned in. Thank you to Hindman Settlement School for having me. I feel like I'm breaking up a little bit. Can y'all still hear me okay? I need to sit still, maybe. I get jittery. Um, What's next? I'm referring back to my little outline here. Are y'all outliners? I do the bullet points and everything. <clears throat> I wanted to read another little quote that someone gave me about planting by the signs. And this one is really a really a beautiful thought. And this is someone who kind of grew up like I did again with a grandparent who planted by the signs and who took that tradition very seriously. Um, this was a uh, given to me by a friend of mine who is an indigenous Appalachian and her grandparents mixed the idea of indigenous indigenous uh sorry guys I got distracted by everything sorry <clears throat> this is from a story from a friend of mine whose grandparents mixed their indigenous cultural 
farming techniques with the traditions of planting by the moon or the zodiac. And she sent me a lovely little piece. She wrote it out as kind of a piece of prose of a memory of hers of planting by the signs. And I really wanted to share that with you guys. And because I thought it was beautiful and I felt really special that she shared it with me. The weatherman calls for rain again for the third week in a row. April has come and closed quick and we only have two wigs left in the throat. My paw has grown anxious to get back into the field. The second set of taters has to go out. Two more reeks and they'll do nothing but rot, he said in a far grouchier tone than his usual monotone expression. The stress was getting under his skin, but he was a product of tradition. We'll get out there and throw them in the ground. If you plant it, it'll grow. My granny howled from her usual seat in the kitchen. Their differing, differing views in the signs were daylight and dark. Paul shook his head in disbelief, even more aggravated by her words. Get your coat, Hook Day. We'll show her. I especially love that story because her grandparents had such differing opinions on planting by the signs. So her grandmother thought it was a bunch of hokum, honestly. And this was her, you know, her, her grandmother was an older woman of an older generation where that was taken pretty seriously. But uh, she thought it was a bunch of baloney. And her grandfather thought it was the gospel. So I think that was an interesting little twist on planning by the signs and how some folks take it seriously and some do not. Um, and I think now we're going to move on to the second section of the book. I don't know how long I was supposed to read, Jason. Were we doing seven to eight? Because I'm liable to go over if you let me. So if y'all are ready for me to hush anytime, you please tell me, okay? Um, thank you, Lisa. My grandma, like I said, my great mamma has always planted by the signs. Now, me and my mamma have, have been experimenting. We uh, have been doing raised beds and a few other things and just kind of playing around with it. But we still get our, uh, we still get our calendar every year. You, you know, even, um, uh, even if you're experimenting, it's good to kind of change things around. And that was something else that a modern friend of mine had to tell me about planting by the signs. This person uh, very much grew up with the tradition. She was raised by grandparents, again, and very close to them. And they wanted to share a little bit about some of the traditions they grew up with in their family. Let me just find, I'm sorry, I'm finding the right story here. Because I wasn't going to share this one, but now it's occurred to me. And I just need to have it. Okay, as, as I said earlier, we were talking about um, certain signs are fertile and certain signs are barren. Uh, water signs and earth signs are, are, fair, are fertile and air and fire signs are barren. So this was something that she said to me that I thought was interesting. Um, certain signs are dry, others moist. And I have experimented with moon phases outside of the planting table. Like say, it's a bad day to plant because the moon's in Leo. However, there's a new moon happening. So she said, I've had some success that way. New moons are excellent for planting. And maybe that balanced out the Leo. Otherwise, we also can, oh, she was the person who was telling me that uh, they consult the almanac to give haircuts, which is one I'd heard before when you should get a haircut to make your hair grow more or to keep it from growing so fast. You can do either one. But I thought that was really interesting that uh, she kind of is adapting the traditions that she learned and using her informed, her informed view of planting by the signs and kind of trying to bring that with her into a, into a different sort of agriculture and even mi just mixing around the old traditions to see what works. Um, that was also, let, okay, let's, like I said, y'all, I could go on and on. This is like, this is, this is important stuff to me. And I love, again, I said, thank you so much to Hyman Settlement School like 50 times, but I've always wanted to do something with Hyman. Y'all are a beacon of hope for, you know, the backwoods kids who are these nerdy youngins who still love their home and their hillbilly traditions and roots. So I just want to say thank y'all again for having me. 
And now I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about the second section of the book, which is when the signs are in the breast. Now, when the signs are in the breast, that associates with, for example, um, cancer. Cancer is a sign, a water sign. So if your calendar says that the signs are in cancer, then it may be a good time to plant. The grand should be fertile. And uh, so this section is about planting and the work of tending to the things you've planted. And I want, I keep mentioning that tobacco farm. So I wanted to, uh, to read, a, read a backer poem before we get much further here. And this is from the second segment, uh, section of the book, which is called When the Signs Are in the Breast. I'm gonna show you guys these cool title pages too. I love, I, I always wanted to have a book that had sections. Makes you feel so professional, doesn't it? <clears throat> this poem is called Pulling Plants. It's early morning. A before the sun comes up and the rooster crows kind of early morning. We don't have a rooster. Just an alarm clock and a bunch of cats and dogs and sleep in our eyes as we head out the door and trudge through the dew toward the big blue ford. A cab and a half with a bed full of feed sacks. My baby brother still has a scar from where the fold down back seat nearly bit his thumb off. But that was a different day. Today we're headed to the tobacco fed bed over at Newfoundland. And the sky is suddenly pink every time it peeks through the hills around a curve. Cutting and hanging wasn't for the women and the children. At least not unless the men were laid up bad or no count kind of lazy. And that is a poem from the second section of my book, Planted by the Signs. That section is called When the, when the Signs Are in the Breast, which is a fertile time. I, want, I showed you guys the picture of my, my sweet little mammal breaking beans. Here it is again on the inside of the book. So I would like to read this poem because I know that it's not just me. I know probably every Appalachian on earth has, has memories of breaking beans. So this is a good one for all of us, I think. And I think it also kind of sets the scene uh for modern farm life as we knew it and as we grew up with it which i guess isn't modern now i'm old uh a lot older than i look but i guess they have all sorts of new methods now but this was a garden scene that i grew up on and that stuck in my head so much so that i wrote a poem about it you know 20 years later we are an agricultural assembly line Weathered human machinery tucked away under a rusty tin roof. Sweating and solar powered, we are lost in the task at hand. The front porch hums with the rhythmic sound of breaking beans. Plump green pods snap and pop under the pressure of steady fingers. Female voices rise and fall, punctuated by a scattered thump. A handful of Kentucky wonder bouncing in the bottom of a five gallon bucket. The sun is sliding down to meet the hills. We swim in damp evening air. When it beads and condenses into fat drops on my upper lip, I can smell the garden it came from. And men come up from the garden. Broad hats and broad backs wind up a long dirt path to pause at the front porch delivering pails labeled fisher's lard but loaded with a tender pick bounty they spill it out around our feet greasy beans and half runners bush beans and turkey beans and pole beans and green sleeves and that's another poem about my life on a farm in Appalachia and my experiences um, harvesting and breaking and picking and hoeing the damn rows, you know. We've been talking about tobacco farms and I know if any of you all grew up on a tobacco farm, 
Ain't nobody alive that likes pigtailing, you know. And I know, I know I'm going to have some people send me a message say, Oh, you're spoiled. Back in the day, we didn't have a setter. We had to use those hand setters. And I know y'all, but still, when you're a seven-year-old and you're walking behind that, <laughs> behind that setter for about 10 miles, you start to get, start to get tired. Listen to mommy. She said, we put up about 110 quarts the year that poem's about. See, she remembers the exact year. That was a good year. All the signs lined up just right this that year, didn't they, mama? Oh, thank you for that little tip, Lori Williams Gear Heart. That is nice. Yeah, you can find copies of the almanac online all over the place. Um, I trust the old farmer's almanac, but you know, there are a lot of different ones that are available, and you can always order you a copy. Most feed stores. You know, for a tradition that nobody follows, it's still everywhere, you know. So I know somebody out there is still still making use of that almanac. Um, I want to get through all three sections of the book. <clears throat> but there was one more, for sure at least, that I wanted to read out of this section. And I'm debating on whether it should be a garden one or a mammal one. So I'm going to do one, uh, sort of one of each. I I just, I'm missing my grandmother a lot. I know y'all are hearing me get the voice breaky. Um, her birthday was this past summer. She would have been nine, eight years old. No, God, she would have been up, up near hundred now. She always loved a big birthday party. I don't know. She loved the Christmas decorations and helping me get all that. And she would have loved to see, uh, to see 110 quarts of beans in the freezer. <laughs> We didn't get that many this year, but this is a poem about my great grandmother, um, Lovell, and her husband, my great papa, who was also a wonderful little man, Charlie and Lovell. He came to pick her up in a car that cranked, Thurston in the Model T, wearing a slick hairdo and a bow tie, askew. He was handsome, though stiff and nervous standing next to a pretty farm girl in front of the family barn on a first date in the 40s. He's awful handsome, I exclaim, over this man who was never her husband. I reckon he was, she replied, nodding with the girlish trace of a sly grin on her thin lips. Well, how come you didn't marry him, Mamma? I ask, knowing he had asked. She pauses to consider the photo in the album in front of us. The couple stands close, but they never touch, frozen inches apart forever. She looks down at me from her broken lazy boy, like I'm plumb eight up, and answers matter-of-factly, well, I didn't love him. Every evening when I help her into bed and lift her tired legs, onto the feather tick mattress. She turns to look longingly at another picture, something more recent, snapped in the 70s on a family picnic down in Cold Spring. Happiness in the spur of the moment. No time to pose for the click of the camera. She stares through the separation of death at the two of them, laughing, glowing love and wading ankle deep in a creek his wiry arm wrapped around her wide waist eternally. My mama and papa were hands down the best couple I've ever known in my life. Um, they like to sleep in on Sunday mornings together. They like to make breakfast together. They, my great mama would bend over to get biscuits out of the oven, you know, and I remember this in my childhood. They had to be in their 80s. And Great Papa would walk right up behind her and smack her on the backside. And she said, well, Charlie. But it was that, oh, well, Charlie. You know, <laughs> she loved it. She she loved his attention and his company. And he loved her attention and her company. And they really, they really adored each other. I want to do one more poem. Let's see what I got here. Out of this section. Here's the one I was looking for. This one's called Taters and Rainbows. We're bringing it back to Agrilatia with some taters. I chased rainbows across two counties. First out in Farmers, then coming down Christie Creek and around the ridge, 
driving between rural root raindrops, the kind that leave the blacktop breathing steam. I was sure I'd catch up with one as I topped Murdy Waddle Hill, where the light likes to play in among the broom sage. But I just missed it, and I followed a black cloud around the curbs, still feeling gracious that the garden got good and wet. Taters are more tangible than rainbows. Okay, so I don't have a whole lot of time left, but I would like to keep keep talking with y'all some, and we're going to keep talking about poetry, and we're going to keep talking about planning by the signs. If anybody, like I said, if anybody else has a planning by the signs story that they, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm shifting through poems here, trying to decide what I can keep, what, what we are going to have to cut. Um, but if anybody has any planted by the sign stories, I'd love to hear them. Oh, I didn't even get to the one I wanted to tell the most. Uh, how many of you have heard that a woman who is having her period, a person on their period should not be in the garden? That right there is one of the biggest things that goes along with planting by the Zodiac. And I heard more than one story about people who tested this theory. And I can tell you the story that I did it myself. My mamma told me, we can sauerkraut every year. That is something that we do every year. It is pretty much now the only thing we can. Sometimes if we have a whole lot of tomatoes, we'll do, uh, we'll do salsa or do something exciting like spaghetti sauce. But uh, we usually can kraut every year. And I, I thought, oh, mamma. That is a silly, sexist, old man thing to say. And, you know, there ain't going to be a problem with me, no matter what's going on between my legs, if I go out there in that garden and cut that cabbage and we can get some kraut made. Well, she fought me hard enough that she wouldn't let me cut it. She's like, you're not ruining this whole crop of cabbage. And uh, I said, you know what? I just don't believe it, Mama. She said, fine. She gave me one head of cabbage and five jars. She had me cut that head of cabbage and can it up. You know, she had me make five jars of kraut and she set my five jars of kraut away from the jars of kraut that she had made. And I don't know why, I don't know why, and I don't know what to tell y'all, but every single one of those jars of kraut turned. It went bad. And every single one of the jars that Mamma made turned out just fine. So I think that's an interesting uh, hillbilly planting by the stars thing, you know, keep your woman out of the garden. Keep, keep anybody who's got a visit from Aunt Flo away from, uh, away from the garden, which is fine by me because I could use a break anyway. Dang. Uh, that's odd. Did that strike you guys as strange? I hope not. But okay. This next section of the book is when the signs are in the breast. Now, no, wait, when the signs are in the reins. Now, if you don't know what that means, the reins of the blood, that's when the signs are in the blood. So, um, for example, Libra is a sign that is in the reins. Libra is an air sign, and so therefore it is not a good time to plant. Uh, if the signs are in Libra, mind your business. But, however, when the signs are in the rains, it can be a good time to transplant flowers, to prune things, to uh, take care of business like that. But a lot of the times when the signs are in the rains is the best time to mess with your flower beds. So this whole um, section of the book also came to be about my grandmother's death as well um, and the flowers that I associate with her and, and her life. So I want to read you a poem from this section. <clears throat> and this one is one that came from originally from the zine style chat book that Jason mentioned earlier. My mom and I worked together to do a chat book called Mommy Mamma and Them. She did the illustrations. I did the poetry. And we combined forces. And this is the titular poem from that uh, collection from years ago that has kind of evolved and grown with me and grown with my poetry. So it's called Mommy and Mamma and Them. 
I love to listen to mommy and mama and them sitting out on the porch of the evening, breaking beans and telling stories or shucking corn and sharing gossip. Didn't much matter the task at hand. The result was rural root sorority. Women in their element, loving every minute of it and daring the sun to sink any lower on their conversation. Mamma's laugh would come from the ground up, make her whole body and the foundations shake. When her feisty blonde younger sister let fly a cuss word that they'd have quarreled at the boys over. Mommy smiled at the scene and hummed along to an old country song spinning somewhere around in her head. There was always something to do, and the women all lit in and went to it. Their calloused hands kept busy getting things done. There was always a row to hoe, a supper to cook, a man whose britches and ego required mending. There were children and livestock to tend, and Mommy and Mam on them pecked around like a whole pack of mother hens on the prowl. Of the evening, they'd roost out on the porch to cluck in comfort for a while before that damn cock crowed again. Uh oh, am I froze, y'all? I think I got caught up in some weird faces for a minute there, but I, maybe we're back on track now. I'm sorry about that. But I want to move on and, yeah, read from this very last section before we close up for the evening. Um, as I said, this section is called When the Signs Are in the Rains. And the rains is the blood. This poem is called Breathing Ghosts. I am haunted by old fashioned ways. I am rooted too deep to till it all up and turn over. I'll never be a transplant blooming out in a rooftop garden or flourishing in foreign soil. I am the prodigal seed. Dandelion fluff finding a way back to where it began. I may drift but I'll always land in the hills, in the boonies, in Kentucky. Carried by a current of homesickness coming in chronic, reliable waves. Here, here I breathe deep and do my best. And I know my mission. Here, I feel the ghosts of generations of family. Kinfolks filtered into my lungs off the country air. Familiar ghosts and chills up my spine because sometimes it's dark that way and scary because roots can get tangled. They can smother out anything else that dares to try to grow close. I think, you know, being Appalachian and choosing to live an agricultural life and a farm life and a country life, it does get lonely. You know, it does get lonely sometimes. And I think probably all of us have felt that. But, you know, who knows what's in the stars, right? Who knows what those signs are going to tell you one of these days. It is pushing up on eight. I'm going to do just a couple more poems if you all would like. Um. I really hope that you've enjoyed this. I've really enjoyed spending time with you. I also really hope that it's been useful in some ways. I know I didn't have a lot of like super pertinent information about the actual process of planning by the signs. Am I talking over somebody? I hear, I hear typing. I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay, anyway. I do want to read just a couple more. A couple more things before we wrap it up for the evening. Um, this was a really sad chapter. Because a lot of these poems ended up being about the loss of my grandmother. And, you know, being a caretaker is not, is not an easy... Uh, 
Not an easy job to do. But before I get into these poems, I just want to kind of, I do want to offer you guys a little bit of useful information. Um, I do want to offer you guys a little bit of useful information. Planning by the signs is all about the moon. It's about the waxing and the waning of the moon. Okay, plant in the fertile signs, water, fertile, and earth are fertile signs. Um, and above ground crops, stuff like lettuce and tomatoes and your peas and squash, you need to do that when the moon is waxing, uh, which means when the moon is on its way to getting full. And your below ground crops, that's taters, carrots, anything you want to plant down there, radishes, turnips, not radishes. Do radishes run around? I never grew radishes. Turnips, though, you can plant some turnips. Uh, you can plant all of those below ground when the moon is waning. That means when you're coming down from a full moon. Uh, so, and again, water and earth, those are barren, uh, those are the fertile signs. Fire and air, those are the barren signs. And you can check your farmer's almanac to tell you what days are good to plant. What days are good to cut your hair? What days are good to, you know, take a chance on an investment? You never know. You never know what the Zodiac man's going to tell you. Uh, I would love to do a few more poems since you guys are, are being so kind to have me. This one directly has to do with what we've been talking about, the rains, the blood. Um, it's called Blooms and the Blood. And this is another photo of mine. It's a lovely little piece of clover that I did. <clears throat> I ain't afraid of bumblebees or the itchy aftermath of chiggerweed. The clover's too green, vibrantly begging to be disturbed. And so I flop down on the ground, flat on my back and weak against the temptation to feel the earth enfold me, hold me. I smell lilies and chocolate mint and honeysuckle vining high. I feel the soil soak into my veins straight into my blood, pumped into my heart. I close my eyes and feel the beat of it blooming and remember how you should only plant flowers when the signs are in the rains. Blossoms and bulbs are begat by blood. And here, since we're talking about the moon so much, disclaimer, this one's got a little bit of language in it. Let's hope Mamaw's not watching tonight. I get in trouble sometimes, y'all. She goes, of course I invite my sweet little Mamaw to my readings, and I take her everywhere I go if I get a chance. She deserves to see everything I get to see, you know. And uh, sometimes when you're a little backwards girl, you don't get to see that much. Uh, my writing has taken me further out into the world than anything else. But I want to read a poem since we're on on the kick about the moon. Let's, let's do this one. It's called Supermoon. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's an angry breakup poem. I don't know. That's fueled by the moon or I don't know. Just a lonesome night in the woods. We'll see. We'll see what y'all think. Supermoon. Maybe we're all just cosmic mush, she thought. She stood in the dark of the holler alone and looked up and up at the uninterrupted sky. She felt the humid air catch and hang in the wet pink insides of her throat, suspended. Maybe it's that fucking moon's fault, she thought, and she felt a rusty red clot passing through her most sensitive parts, making her weak at the knees with the power of it all. The primordial copper stank of potential life deposited in a pair of granny panties. Maybe we're all just cosmic mush, malleable to the moods of the supermoon. The woods around her are all lit up. Possums and skunks and raccoons creep through the underbrush. Nocturnal entities are taken aback by the light, cautious. But the deer are wide awake at an odd hour, and they snap twigs for the supermoon in thanks. The woman alone in the clearing next to the garden doesn't waver. She stares into the pale pockmarked face in the sky. And she wonders if the animals can smell her 
if all that backwoods bullshit about black bears sniffing out a woman on the rag is true. Maybe we're all just moonstruck mush pulled toward the fecal glow. Again, I'm really, really glad to have y'all with me tonight. And I just want to I'll say that I hope each and every one of you is supporting Hyman Settlement School and all their recent endeavors and all their endeavors, period, because they really do a lot for this region and a lot for the arts in this region and a lot. I'm I'm tickled to death about this agrilacha movement because I hate to see people going away from the farms and selling the old home places and and moving off to something else, you know, and, and I understand, too, because I know that this is a difficult life. And uh, living in Appalachia and choosing to use the land as one of your primary resources is, is not easy these days. It's really tough to get by. But for those of you who stayed, like me, I'm always here. Reach out to me. Um, we can help each other together. I'd like to read just a couple more. Just a couple more. One more. Oh, are you done with me, Jason? All right, I'm gonna. Okay, okay. Keep okay. going, I'm keep going. It's more. great. Okay, all right. I'll read two more, and then and then I'm gonna quit for the night. Uh, but this one is called Funeral Flowers, and it's again from the last section of the book. I've taken up residence in her favorite chair. I pulled it up by the roots from its warm, cozy spot in front of the stove, where it dented the carpet eternally. I reset it deep in the far end of the kitchen where the light is real good amid the foliage of house plants and woods beyond the windows. We're situated right on the ridge line, suspended over the holler on top of a hilltop, pushed flat enough for the trailer to squat just right. But the hill gets steep pretty quick and the boughs of rough black pine and the slender needles of spruce bob and bounce on a breeze at the whim of a cold wind. Her funeral flowers won't grow in the foothills. They're hothouse flowers that fold under the weight of winter just around the bend. And I just want to do one more. It is one of the last poems in my collection, Planted by the Slides. Um, it's just one more that I'd love to read to y'all that I like just because I like to read it out loud mostly. And I think it kind of sums me up pretty well <clears throat> from around here. Oh, let me sidetrack real quick. I get asked a lot. Are you from around here? Uh, I guess on initial look, people maybe not think that I grew up in a hall or somewhere, but I am indeed from around here. I sprouted. From a hillbilly hoodoo garden nurtured by the signings. Mm. Let me get a drink and start over because this is a good one and I want y'all to hear it. I sprouted from a hillbilly hoodoo garden nurtured by the shining signs in the stars in the night sky, tended to by the phases of the moon. I bloomed full from superstition, from Mars, from timeless magic mothers who wear the pants and grow the food and put it on the table. I sprang up from the rich soil and I busted up out of the dirty dirt. I am a bastard born of the lusty loins of a bad boy hick with a handsome blonde mustache. I was conceived unexpectedly in an encounter with a beautiful, kind-hearted country girl. I was created when opposites attract and connect and dance and fall apart together. I kicked my way out of a powerful one-woman womb at the end of a gravel road. I burst from the belly of a holler in the sticks in Kentucky. I come hard from laughter instead of tears from a place of mythic mamas and papas and kin thicker than blood or water or moonshine. 
I descended from a change in elevation, from thin, sweet air. I found myself in tangles of dogwood and laurel and sassafras and hemlock. I was swaddled in the stout vines of honeysuckle, and I float still on a cloud of monarch butterflies, fueled by the grape candy scent of lilacs. Thank you all again so much for having me. We got just a tad bit of lag, but what a wonderful, wonderful evening with Miss Misty Skaggs, folks. Tremendous, tremendous poet. Uh, just a phenomenal Appalachian, and I'm so proud that she uh, she chose us uh, to come tonight and spend our, our, our time together. Uh, folks, let's put our hands together and let's give her all kinds of accolades here in the, uh, uh, in the comment section, folks. Miss Misty Skaggs. Bye.